It's no ordinary police procedural. Download the Law & Order podcast. These are their stories. Join hosts Kevin Flynn, Rebecca Lavoy, and their special guests as they take an irreverent look at an episode from either SVU, Criminal Intent, or Original Recipe. The ones you've seen a million times in reruns. After the recap, they talk about the real-life crime cases that inspired the shows. Tune in for their regular features like Favorite Detective Team, Hey, It's That Guy, and Ripped from the Headlines. You think you know who did it, but you don't know who did it. Subscribe to These Are Their Stories, the Law & Order podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, or go to lawandorderpodcast.com. This podcast contains adult language and stories of true crime. If you don't like laughing, crying, or being horrified at the actions of other humans, this podcast is not for you. it up or you want me to take it up? <laughs> I'm not sure if I know how to take it up. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to Resolve Mysteries. This is season two, episode two, and this is the show where we rewatch, recap, and give you the latest updates to cases featured on the show, Unsolved Mysteries, the best show ever. I'm Eliza. I'm Allison. And I'm Carlin. If you can't remember our voices, just scroll back to this part and listen to us say our names. Maybe that will help you. <laughs> we have got a really great episode for you today. Before we get into that, we really appreciate when you leave us reviews. It means so much to us. And just so you know, for every review that we receive, we donate a dollar to um, an organization. And this month's is the Portland chapter of Relay for Life. So that's what it is for September. You have like half a month to get those in. In. Yeah. So please do that. We truly on our text thread send them to each other screenshotted. Have you seen this one yet? This mm -hmm. one's so nice and they make our day. So and they really help out the podcast also. Um, we have some patrons to shout out. You can go to patreon.com slash resolve mysteries to become a patron and get extra fun content. Allison, you want to shout out some patrons? Yeah. Thank you to the following patrons. Jenny H. Brandon. Right. Yeah. That's such a cool name. I know. For, I like it. For a girl. And Katie G. And Jesse B. Thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate your support. Yeah, thank Ooh, you. Woo. So yeah, you will get extra content if you become a patron. We do a 50 States of the Unsolved series, a THDI series, which gets a little bit twisty sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then we're also starting a new series we're very excited about on Patreon called The Forgotten Few. Yes. And our first episode of that releases on September 23rd. And those are just cases that were cut from um, the re-edit. Basically, you can't find the segments anywhere, but we were able to watch, but we were able to find them and be able to research them. Yeah. And so we can talk to you about them on Patreon. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a great series. Yeah, yeah. The first one turned out to be a goodie. So. Yeah. So good. We just have three segments today. Yeah. Allison, you go first with... So I'm doing the unexplained death of Jack Brown. Mine is an unexplained segment and it is... I'm going to just call it Blinking Jesus. <laughs> Love it. Jesus wept. And I... This is Eliza. Again, hello. And I have a fraudy, but it's, well, it's a terrible fraudy. It is. But it's not a boring fraudy. I can't I believe say. that we were going to ask Lynn Manuel Miranda to write a musical about this guy last episode. Oh, yeah. Remember? Yeah. Terrible, terrible story. Yeah. Yikes. But also interesting with some elements. Yeah. So I'm excited to hear about it. All right. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. Cool. We're just going to go through some possibilities. Okay. You know. um, okay, so the first segment of season two, episode two, is an unexplained death, and it is it is the murder of Jack Brown. Um, so January 11th, 1984, in Ypsilanti, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, at the real estate office of Jack Brown, around 11 a.m., two men entered the office. One man stood guard, and the other man headed towards the office that Jack worked out of. In the reenactment, Jack is on the phone in his office and he says, quote, we have trouble here. Stack says it seemed like the men were familiar with the layout of the building. When the man gets to the doorway of Jack's office, the gunman says, well, you think you're pretty smart, don't you? And then Jack says, well, maybe. And he just shoots Jack. It's yep. fucking crazy, like execution style. Yeah, it's very disturbing. Yeah. And then the reenactor made a really weird scream. 
Oh, he did? Yeah. I did note that, again, the reenactors are getting good. I know. What are we going to, like, trash talk if reenactors mm-hmm. are great? They're putting us out of biz. I know. Um, so then they show the men shoving the other three employees into the bathroom and locking them in. Oh, my God. And then the men walked away. Like, they didn't have masks on. They uh, were, I know. They were just like, I mean, I thought they, like, would have killed the other people, but. That's what they thought, too. Mm-hmm. And weird to put them in the bathroom and then leave. Like, I know. Why? Yeah, I guess so. They so no one chase them down, but. or like grab a phone really quickly. Right, like give they them were trying to leave, leave yeah. them scared so that they would wait a while to leave the bathroom. Yeah, yeah that makes time sense. to get away. But they had already shot him in front of them, and then yes. they like why they just didn't not care. wait. <laughs> no masks on. I know, crazy. So Stack says that Jack Brown died twelve hours later. I read some articles that said fifteen from a single bullet shot wound to the neck. Then they show a photo of Jack, and he's got style. He is like in this polyester oh, suit yeah. with sunglasses. It's a pretty great photo. Stack tells us that Brown lived in Ypsilanti for most of his life and was a member of the local chamber of commerce and the Rotary Club. At the time of his death, he was 47 years old. Stack tells us the murder of Jack Brown was no random act of violence, nor was robbery the motive. It was a contract killing planned and executed by professionals. Stack says, quote, but Brown was no mafia don. And all you have to do is look at one photo of Jack Brown to know that he was absolutely not a no. mafia don. <laughs> absolutely not. No way. No way. You don't say. Mm-hmm. So he was a small town realtor and Stack asks, quote, who killed him and why? A five-year investigation has not been able to answer these questions. We're told that Brown's real estate company put him in contact with many members of the community and they couldn't understand why he would be murdered by a contract killer. Dutch Jordan, the vice president of the realty office, tells us there was nothing in Jack's background that he was aware of that would warrant this kind of problem whatsoever and surely not murder. Jordan thinks the gunman came to challenge Jack in some way. He says he overheard the gunman and Jack exchange two sentences, like I mentioned earlier, and then the gunshot. And he says after the gun went off, he figured they had bought the farm and the gunman would get rid of the eyewitnesses as well. However, he says looking back, it seems like they just had a problem with Jack and no one else in the office on that fateful morning. He uses the term fateful Mm -hmm. morning. He's a little dramatic, Mm -hmm. but he's a sweetie. Detective Sergeant Ed Hall of the Ypsilanti Police Force says that no one seemed to know anything shady about Jack or anything he could be involved in that could be termed quote shady. He said shady too much and I feel like when he rewatched it he was like why the hell did I say shady so much? It's like when we listen and we're like god I say like all the time. Oh I am the one. I'm the worst out of the three of us. Um, Hall says that his lack of shadiness may mean that Brown was leading a double life. Something that no one else knew about. Family, friends, anyone in that area. The night before Jack's murder his brother saw him on the phone in a state of extreme agitation. Norm Brown says he could tell by his conversation that he was getting very upset. He asked if there was a problem and Jack said no and that he would see him tomorrow. Norm then speculates that the phone call had something to do with the shooting the following day. So he played cards every week with that group of men that we saw in the reenactment. So it was very strange for him to not play cards and say, I'm going to leave and I'll just see you tomorrow. Yeah. Jack's wife, Ann Brown, said that when someone is murdered in this way, you look back and you search Mm -hmm. your mind. You search everywhere for clues and you remember things Mm -hmm. that someone said that didn't fit. This is a big thing, though. This um, isn't like... Yeah. yeah. So it isn't like it wasn't a throwaway sentence, you know? Yeah, I thought that was weird. Yeah. She's like, and if you just think really hard, it's yeah. like, girl. Tell what he said. So they show a reenactment of Anne and Jack in the car. Uh, she's driving, and they had just left a Christmas party. Anne says Jack had a little too much to drink and was <laughs> rambling. And she was annoyed She with was him. so annoyed. I just could not believe this scene. Yeah. I can't... Yeah, I can't believe this really happened. So Anne... Anne Says Jack had a little too much to drink and was rambling. And at some point, he asked her, "Quote: What would you do if some important people, some powerful people, did something wrong?" Then he says, and this is very specific: "Quote: Would you write their names on a list and put it in a safe deposit box?" Jack's like asking for a friend, obviously. Yeah. And Anne's like, if you really think super hard, (laughs) you'll think of something the person said. She's like, I guess there were some little clues. Yes. There were a few red flags, but it was super hard to tell. Like, Anne, really? Come on. Press him on this. Uh What is going on? And even if you don't get anything when he's drunk... Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. Yeah, ask like, him again. Yeah. Like, so remember when you were wasted and you, and you said, said that some, funny thing. Is there a list I need to know about? Yeah. Or a yeah. safety deposit box? So Anne says in the car, she says, what are you talking about? And Jack says, 
probably safer for you not to know. And then he chuckles, like, okay, Jack, really? Jeez. <laughs> like, oh my and God. she's just like, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know. Crazy. I mean, I guess it was different in the 80s, but okay. Anne tells us basically when she hears herself telling the story, she's almost embarrassed. It sounds so unreal. Politi- she is almost. embarrassed. She's, yeah, she's yeah. embarrassed. Politically powerful people doing something wrong. You just let it drop, she says. <laughs> She says she knows she should have asked more questions, but he told her she wasn't supposed to know about it, and she believed him. Oh, my gosh. Ladies' wives. Yep. Yep. Listened to direction (laughs) in a way that we don't understand today. No, we truly can't Um, fathom. Yeah. Anne says once she got over the shock of Jack's death, she searched for that safety deposit box key, but it was nowhere in the house. She said she wasn't resolved. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Oh, interesting. (laughs) Um, And she wanted to know who these powerful people were, what their names are, and she wants the killers, the people that actually shot Jack, but she wants to know the people that hired them. Stack tells us that the same day Jack was murdered, a major drug bust occurred in the area, triggered by an anonymous informant. Could there be a connection? Detective Hall says he thinks it's very possible that there are people in the community who know more about what happened. They're either afraid to say or they're involved in the conspiracy to kill Jack. Anne says it's unfair because Jack didn't deserve to die. She's she says very obvious things. Yes. <laughs> yes, she does. The most. She's such a sweetie, but you're kind of like, mm-hmm. She says if he did do something wrong or bad, she can't think of anything he could have done that would give those people the right to come and take his life. Yeah. Also that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Stack says that the man who shot Jack was 35 to 40 years old, six foot tall, and wore a beige jacket and light colored pants. Why would you describe the clothes, especially if they're that vague and the murder happened five years ago? <laughs> do you think the description of the clothing is going to help find the killer? Yes. He's still walking around in those killer- beige never change their clothes. Yeah. Never. He's like, why won't someone recognize me? <laughs> um, I'm wearing khakis. <laughs> I'm in this really specific outfit. Um, he was armed with a 38 caliber revolver. And also the sketch looks a little like James Dean. He's a hot con. Mm, I love a hot con. <laughs> hot con. His accomplice was about 50 years old, 5 foot 10, and he was wearing coveralls and a blue stocking knit cap. Presumably he's still wearing them five years later. <laughs> he was also armed with an automatic handgun. And then the show doesn't give an update. So here we go. There's really nothing about this case. I guess I guess it just wasn't a really fun one for people to delve into. I mean, some of the cases when you research it, there's just so many people talking about it. Yeah, at very least, there's like a million message boards. Yeah. Um, So there's not a ton about this. Tracy Lynn S. on Sitcoms Online tells us a bit about Ypsilanti. Uh, UM called Ypsilanti a a suburb of Detroit, but in reality, it's more like an extension of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay. Mm. Um, Nowadays, it's a good medium-sized town, a small city of about 20,000 plus residents, And it's the same amount of residents as in the 80s, according to city data that I found. When Jack Brown's murder was investigated, chances are that it was done fairly well since this wasn't a little podunk town and um, they were used to crime. It's not that well off of the city. It's blue collar, working class for the most part, and 25% of the residents live below the poverty level. Also, according to city data, the murder rate is about one in five per year. Mm. However, there's a lot of other crime. The national average for crime is 320.9 on the city data scale, and Ypsilanti uh, ranks much higher at nearly 700, with burglaries, robberies, thefts, and assaults making up the uh, bulk of the crime. Jeez. I mean, if 25% of people are living below the poverty level, that's, Mm. you know... I mean, those are crimes of desperation, really. Yeah. Um, And then there's a lot of theories that he knew something that he shouldn't, and he was either involved with the illegal activity or was going to tell on the illegal activity. So he wasn't involved, but he knew too much. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The general consensus is that he didn't expect the guys to shoot him. He was expecting to be threatened, which Mm. is why he maybe gave the snarky Mm. answer. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about that. Yeah, he thought that, I think he thought they were just going to rough him up and intimidate him. And then I found this from a user, JVBRO, and the user writes, This was interesting. I stumbled on this site. Jack Brown was my ex-husband, and our children, now all grown, would love to have an answer to his death. What? Mm Mm-hmm. I can tell you that when Jack died, he had $18 in his bank account. He was not rich and had taken over the business from my father, who had taken it over from his father. He was the kind of realtor who turned down listings from older people if he thought it was not in their best interest to sell their home. He had his faults. He was a, quote, player with women, and he drank too much, but he was otherwise a good guy. The, quote, conspiracy at Eastern Michigan theory has always stuck with me as the most probable answer, but I'm not sure we will ever know. From talking to witnesses in the office at the time, I don't think he knew the shooters, but I do think he knew why they were there. Mm. As I understood what he told his current wife, so the wife that they interview is his current wife, but he was really, really close with his ex-wife. I found an article about her releasing his ashes 
Okay. So she was profoundly affected by his death. Of course, yeah. As I understood what he told his current wife after the Christmas party, it was, if you knew something about someone important and people wouldn't believe you, what would you do with the information? So it wasn't, what would you do with the information? It was, what if people didn't believe you? And I think that's how the safety deposit box came up. There was a theory that he knew something crooked about a new business building that Eastern, which is a university, was about to build in downtown Ypsilanti. And there were some kickbacks involved and the names and the same names kept coming up. Who knows? At one point a year later, we offered a $100,000 reward with no real takers. Now we all know if it was something simple, information would have come out then. That's all. I just felt like I had to say something about the kind of person he was. And then she comes back again and says to Google, quote, EMU open letter 2009 Jack Brown, and that the people on the message board might find it interesting. And it's basically an open letter claiming the University of Michigan is using like cronyism and nepotism to take over Eastern Michigan University. I didn't even know there was an Eastern Michigan University, but I guess that's like a linchpin in this town. So they name a bunch of names. And then in the comments, Jack Brown comes up for some reason. And the people in the comments claim that these same people that are discussed in this article involved with University of Michigan and Eastern Michigan University are also responsible for having Jack killed. Then one of Jack's grandkids comments, this is a small city and this Mm -hmm. was a big deal to have someone shot execution style who was like, you know, not a pillar in the community, but an active member. Right, Real yeah. estate agents in a small city know yeah, everybody. Yeah, totally. So then one of Jack's grandkids comments and says, quote, Jack Brown is my grandfather. I am tied with both the Browns and the Stembos, which I guess is another family. I promise you that these rumors aren't just rumors. Ypsilanti is a shady place and it makes me happy knowing that other people are aware of it too. I would shady. just, yeah, I would just be caught super shady. Everyone's shady. Everyone. I would just be cautious when dealing with certain people around here. What the hell? So, like, I guess Jack really did just mess with the wrong people, and everyone seems to have an idea who did it, which is so interesting to me when things like this happen. Because this isn't even, like, this is more of a city in size to Curtis Croft and Jenny Pratt, Mm -hmm. where there's a lot of people involved, and a lot of people know who did it, and no one says anything. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's so frustrating. Yeah. Someone else commented, we all knew it was a paid hit at the time. Follow the money and the power it leads to, and it leads to a clique that has run this township forever. The only other paid hit in Ypsilanti that I'm aware of, this user says, is also unsolved. It involved the murder of a recent immigrant to Ypsilanti in the parking lot of Brandy's party store on Michigan and Summit. That murder was evidently over a loan shark issue. The owner of the store had deep gambling debts. After the murder of his cousin as a warning to pay up, they sold the store to the people who currently own it. I'm not going to say any names. Mm -hmm. After the murder, they moved out of the township. This has gotten me thinking about how organized crime works. What makes these types of crimes almost impossible to solve are one, the victim is an entirely innocent party who has no connection to the perpetrators and is chosen because of a family connection. The family named Stumbo kept coming up. Mm. So perhaps members of his family were involved in something and they murdered Jack as a warning. Jeez. Yeah. So there's a family connection so that the people that they're threatening know what's going on, but it's difficult to tie back legally because the person isn't truly involved in whatever's actually yeah. happening. Um, and that's pretty much the, that's the extent that I got. It does seem like people have their pretty valid theories, but nobody's willing to come forward. There was a theory that he was a victim of mistaken identity. Mm-hmm. Then someone was coming oh. after his son, Jackie Brown. Oh. I didn't find a picture of him, so I have no idea. But I feel like a father and son wouldn't look that much alike. And no, if someone and sent- the weird comments to his wife. The weird comments to yes. his wife. And then also the guy saying, you think you're pretty smart, don't you? It seems pretty him specific. Him saying, well, maybe. Yeah. Um, and, and they then, would know where the son worked versus him. Yeah. Like if someone is sending contract killers there or whatever. Yeah, yeah you're going to assume that they're going to do their... fuck that up. Yeah. yeah. And then there's just a little bit about Dutch Jordan, his vice president. So he passed away. Um, That's like someone's actual name. So it was Darwin Dutch Jordan. Dar- oh, Dutch, like Dutch like was his a nickname. nickname. Yeah. Okay. Um, So he died uh, March 14th, 2015 at the age of 82. And uh, in his obituary, his daughter is talking about the investigation. And she says, quote, the investigation went on for years and they didn't find anything. The Unsolved Mystery Show came and at one point they put together some kind of task force to open difficult unsolved cases. And they also called up my dad, his daughter, Lindy Hunt, said, quote, it was one of the big questions in his life and he never found the answer to it. It wasn't so much who that bothered him. It was why. Yeah. So I was thinking the couple that were shot by the contract killers and those people left the country 
Yeah. Now I feel like whenever that happens and you can't find the people, I mean, they didn't wear masks, just yes. like your guys didn't yes. wear masks. So maybe they just like blew out of the country as soon as it happened. I was yeah. totally thinking of that too. Are you talking about the race Mickey Thompson? Thompson? Yeah. 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 Is that you? Or was yeah, it was that her. was you. Maybe they just left the country yeah. right away. They don't even yeah. have to worry about it, really. They just put some money in their account and they go. Yeah. You know? But yeah, so it's a super sad story. And I read an article, like I said, I don't remember his first wife's name, but it was devastating to her and her family. He had kids and she she's the one that gathered the hundred thousand dollar reward. And I guess his second wife, I'm surprised they interviewed her. I guess they did it because it was appropriate to do and not go to the first wife. Mm -hmm. But they hadn't been together very long and he was in the process of divorcing her. So I think he was really close with his first wife. I think that he probably cheated on her. Oh, he was in the process of of divorcing the second wife? wife? Yes. Oh, I misunderstood that. Yeah, he was in the process of divorcing the second wife. And I don't think they had been together that long. And I think he cheated on his first wife with his second wife. But I think, you know, she still loved him. And so she was really the one that fought to get the case reopened and have people pay attention. She got the reward together. Yeah. And then in the article. That's so funny. And I think that's like something we see a lot on UM is like not interviewing the people who actually were closest to you. Yeah. The Just, person. Yeah. It's the crazy. spouses. Yeah. Or, and I mean, maybe the first, I can't see the first wife not wanting to be in- interviewed because she had like a two page spread in a news article. Yeah. So, um, yeah, she wanted it solved. She wanted the attention. So yeah. I think they probably didn't ask her. Yeah. Or maybe the current wife said she wouldn't participate if the first wife was in it. I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah. Maybe if people just don't want to be on it. And in the newspaper article, she also said something about always thinking they might get back together, which mm. was so sad. Mm. And, you know, she's like, now obviously that's not going to happen. But yeah. yeah. It's just a, it's a wow. sad story and it remains unsolved. And it, I guess because people in positions of power, people are scared of them. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Wow. Great job. Thanks, Paul. I did like that segment. We'll be right back after this short break. Everybody has a story. And not all of those stories are clear black and white issues, even when we think they are. We wonder, how did this happen? Or what is that like? Or what happens next? Are you sure you really want to know? This is Ignorance Was Bliss at IWB Podcast. Hello friends, we are the Ladies of Strange. I'm Ashley. I'm Tiffany. And I'm Rebecca. Have you ever wondered if Jenny's head really did fall off when they removed the green ribbon? Or if aliens are hiding in the tails of comets waiting to take us away? Or if there's any scientific basis to the Ouija board? Well then don't risk your search history and join us each Thursday as we discuss the history, mystery, and theory of all things questionable, odd, and eerie. New episodes are released every Thursday. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. More information about the show, including show notes and links to our social media, can be found on our website, theladiesestrange.com. Keep it strange, lovelies. Um, segment two, we are calling Blinking Jesus. Um, <laughs> it's an unexplained seggy, and it's about the Holy Trinity Church in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. So it starts out with Stack walking the church aisles talking about miracles. And he says that they usually contain phenomena occurring before witnesses that cannot be explained by any known science. And I wrote, bye, Allison. See you later. (laughs) Later, guys. I'm just going to put my head on the desk and you can sort this out. Okay, That's usually where she checks out. Uh, Stack says, quote, but the church is extremely conservative when it comes to officially recognizing a miracle. Is it, though, Mr. Stack? Is it? But then later we find out it is. It is. Yeah. 
He says, only a handful of the miracles have been seriously investigated, and only three in this century have been authenticated. Oh, yes. That's a lot of miracles. So that's why I was like, oh, okay, they really are conservative when it comes to like being like, this is a legit it's a lot of miracles miracle. for us, but for a church, you would think they would want to yes. do as many as possible. But they might look, they might think, okay, if we do too many miracles, we're going to look like a bunch of crackpots. That's true. Right? After reading this and reading about a couple other ones, they actually do thoroughly investigate. Yeah. And like, Harlan's converted. She's a believer. Converted. <laughs> so then Stat goes on to tell us about the three miracles. In 1917, in Fatima, Portugal, it was the site of the most famous 20th century miracle. Three young children said that God had promised to show a sign of his existence. On that day, among crowds of people holding umbrellas, they show photos on UM, the clouds parted and, quote, according to witnesses, the sun touched the earth. Ha- that's, ha- I was like, wait, what? Uh- <laughs> that's not... What does that even mean? So, um, is it a sunset? They show <laughs> seriously. They're like, it's coming, it's coming down. Oh, it's gone. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? So, they show some like weird black and white pictures of this, and they look like a break in the clouds where it's really sunny in the midst of a gray, rainy day, which is a cool sight, but not a miracle. Yeah, well, and I was like, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but that happens in Portland on a regular basis. <laughs> yes. So, I guess we're really blessed. Stack says that thousands make the pilgrimage to Fatima still to celebrate this divine occurrence. So, more recently, according to Stack, another miracle has taken place in a small Yugoslavian village called Medjugorje. Quote, since 1981, four girls and two boys claim they are being regularly visited by the Virgin Mary. Oh my she God. still appears to four of them daily in a local church, and to them this will be the last time she will appear until the second coming of Christ. The visit that will signal the end of the world. Jeez, kids, calm down. Oh my God. The bishop in Medjugorje was like, nah, brah. <laughs> <laughs> But the Pope was like, I mean, let's look into it. <laughs> Don't waste mm-hmm. your time, no, dude. <laughs> no. So at the time of the airing of this episode, it was being, quote, reinvestigated. I'm sorry. Are there miracle detectives? Like, how does this work? Because they hadn't gone into it yet. Well, it's probably like with an exorcism or something, right? Like they send people out to check it out. Mm-hmm. Oh, they do. <laughs> Stack says right now in a small town in Pennsylvania, another miracle is said to have occurred. This time in front of a number of witnesses. Some skeptics believe that this is nothing more than a hallucination. Others suspect a hoax, but many eyewitnesses are positive that they experience something that has no physical or scientific explanation, a phenomenon they insist was divinely inspired. So Stack says that 20 miles north of Pittsburgh, the area surrounding Ambridge, Pennsylvania, has been slowly dying. Stack goes on to explain that it's an old mill town. There's a bunch of abandoned steel mills lining the Ohio River there. Stack says it's a grim reminder of the region's lost prosperity. And I've seen a lot of those towns, like whenever we go east. Yeah, it's, it's sad. It's sad. You can t- I mean, they used to be like the heart of the area, yeah. and now they're like dead with like a lot of empty storefronts. Mm-hmm. And yeah, sad. factory towns and mill towns. Yep. Stack says, however, the many residents of Ambridge refuse Refuse to move out of town. Some of them gather together in the Holy Trinity Church to gain strength from their religious beliefs and one another. So then they cut to them filming in an actual church. Um, it's a high ceilinged white arch um, shaped building with like a large stained glass window at the back. And then at the top of the arch hangs a crucified Jesus. Or sorry, on the stained glass, there's a crucified Jesus. And then hanging in front of that is the wooden and plaster hanging crucifix. So the congregation is reciting the Lord's Prayer under Stack explaining that the church is, quote, a simple house of worship, a reflection of the people that gather under its steeple. And I was like, I wonder how they felt about Stack calling them simple on television. (laughs) I don't think that's how he meant it. So Stack explains that the church is especially proud of its hanging wooden crucifix. This wooden plaster icon has been at the church since 1931. It had been refurbished the previous January by a local artist named Dominic Leo. Oh, Dominic. I know. (laughs) So cut to scenes of Dominic Leo working on the crucifix. He's like carefully touching it up with a tiny little paintbrush. He says he came deeply involved in the work. He said it had been there at the church possibly more than 60 years. So it definitely like needed to be, um, what do they call that? Restored. Restored, yeah. Leo explains that he worked on it for a long time and did the face last and the eyes last of all. He says when he got to the eyes, he just painted them. I put the color of blue-gray into the retina. Jesus definitely was a blue-eyed area. <laughs> let me just I know, you. I said because you know all those Middle Eastern people with blue-gray eyes. <laughs> so then Leo gets very macabre and says, Then I started to put accents into the eye to yes. show the color of death. Yes. Oh, weird. Yeah. He spent too much time with dead Jesus. 
What color is death? Black, I'm assuming. I think he was trying to say like he made them like sunken and like. I don't oh, know. oh, I see. Okay. So Stack says on March 24th, 1989, a special three hour mass was held to celebrate Good Friday. Oh, God, help me. Horrible. <laughs> he explains that it was a devoted group of 300 men and women who take their belief very seriously. Yeah, clearly. And I three. said you would have to <laughs> attend a three hour service. Jeez Louise. So over Stack's explanation, it's um, the congregation is like taking communion. Stack says, Jim Svitkovic is a nephew of the parish priest. That night, he was serving as an altar boy. Jim explains it was a normal night. They were just doing their normal, their usual rituals, as they do in the Catholic Church. Um, He says, I got communion and I went down to the side of the altar, just waiting for everyone else to get done. That's when my brother Tom came up next to me. And I was looking up and I was praying and Stack says, as Jim looked heavenward into the face of Christ, (laughs) Jesus winked at him. He had a stunning (laughs) surprise. The eyes that were once open now appear closed. So Jim says, when I first noticed that the eyes were closed, I was shocked. I didn't know what to believe at first. I was happy, but I was scared at the same time because, (laughs) yeah, I was happy, but I was also scared. Can you imagine? He says, because, you know, you figure that God, he did this right there while I was kneeling right there. Didn't. (laughs) And just to give you, if you haven't watched the episode. We're going to get a really negative review from someone saying that we're too One hundo fine. I mean, if God is going to do a miracle, that's not the one yeah. I would want. That's him what I was saying. I do. He like cure cancer. Yes. That Jesus has been hanging there since the thirties. Maybe he's just tired. I mean, I think to them, <laughs> he's <laughs> just tired. He I wants to, to them, take a little nap. It was symbolic because it was Good Friday, which is the right. day he would have. So di- he would have died. Have died. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh I see. So. He says he turned to tell his brother, Tom. Tom looks up and sees it, but he's, of course, immediately like, Psh, nah. <laughs> so he's like, go over there and check. Maybe the lights are making it look weird, which is what I would have thought, too. So Jim goes around the other side of the altar, looks at it from there. Um, he says he looks up and he saw that the eyes were still closed. Jim says it didn't really hit him until later. He went into the back and thought about it for a few minutes. He says, and that's when I started crying because you don't expect something like that to happen. And, you know, it was something that I was a part of. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're not mad at you. <sighs> Reverend Vincent Spitzovic, the pastor and Jim's uncle, says the boys were crying and he asked them what happened. And they said, the eyes on the cross are closed. Reverend went back out to the sanctuary with another priest and he looked up at the cross and it was changed. He says he looked back at the people and happened to look at the very back and going out the doors was the artist who had refurbished the cross. So he called his name a few times and asked him to come back. He asked him to look at the cross and tell him what he he sees. Leo says at first he thought something was wrong. He was like, oh no, maybe it's falling down. Oh or no, maybe- did I make his eyes brown? Did I <laughs> indicate that he may be Middle Eastern in any way? Person of color. <laughs> Big mistake. Um, so he thought it was going to be like falling down or there was a defect or some of the plaster was coming off or something. But he says something suddenly caught his attention and his neck flipped back and his eyes went straight up to the crucifix. This is when Leo starts getting like super choked up and crying. He says when he looked up, he couldn't believe what he saw. Not only were the eyes closed, but there were, quote, all kinds of tears running underneath them. What the? F- and he said, quote, not only that, but they were fleshy like, like this, touching his own eyes. Oh, he did so much eye touching. And they on were his moving own eyes. like this, demonstrating with his own <laughs> eyes. <laughs> And he said, Wait, all he the said tears- the eyes were moving too? Mm-hmm. He but said, the eyes he were closed. doing this. Oh. <laughs> so, so Jesus was in a full on REM cycle? Yeah. So, <laughs> like I said, he's probably just tired, hanging there all those sleepy. years. 50 years he's of hanging. waiting. Yeah. Um, and he said, all the tears were there, and it was just like the crucifixion was had just started again from 2,000 years, and it looked just like that. They were all on their knees. <laughs> but, like, everyone in this interview area of the show is is really, you can tell they truly believe what they saw. I believe they believe. Um, In the reenactment, all the altar boys are just staring in amazement, and they all start kneeling below the cross and crying. Leo says, I could never forget that. Never, never. Since the crucifix was so high up in the church, they had to bring out a ladder, so they sent Leo up first since he knew the crucifix better than anyone. He climbs to the top and explains that the left eye is closed and the right eye is slightly, slightly open. So he is winking. Which is what it exactly what it looked like in the reenactment of him painting the face. Yes. It looked the same. It's we are looking at it right now. It is literally the, the same. same picture. 
So he says it was just unbelievable what he saw. He explains in more detail the tiny slivers of the color of the eye you could see, then says, and this is what really did it, because when I seen that, it looked like it was burned, that it had been burned from energy of some sort. What are you talking about? <laughs> and he's what the only are one your says words? That. He's like, the only one that says that. What are you fucking saying? Which, who was the guy saying that? The artist? Leo, yeah. Then we have an interview with PA State Trooper Chris Marion. Who they, was, the state troopers get involved? Yes. Wait, I thought Dominic was the artist. It Dominic is. Leo. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Sorry, I thought Leah was a first name. Um, PA State Trooper Chris Marion was another person who had to see for himself. He says he wanted to make sure nobody had tampered with it. Yes, good. He he got real close, quote, like a three-year-old would look into his father's oh, face. Gross. And oh I looked at God. it and realized there's no way. It was too high. I knew no one could have tampered with it, and it was fine, and I felt good about it. They had a ladder. Also, they just said they had a ladder. But how about that horrifying ladder, A ladder that they use, which yeah, is like the A shape and then straight up for like seven rungs. Yeah. Horrifying. <laughs> um, wow, you really remember this segment, huh? I mean, <laughs> yeah, scary. <laughs> He says, I'm sort of glad that this happened to me because as a state trooper, and I've been one for 28 years, I've been trained to look at things a little differently than normal, oh just like gosh. I knew the crucifix a lot better than everybody. Wait, oh, what? my actual. What? I did not remember he said that. <laughs> well, Ew. I knew that everything that happened here wasn't some hoax. It wasn't a bunch of people just making this up. These are the type of people you drink beer with every day, the LOL Catholics. <laughs> and everything that happened here was for a reason and was definitely the most religious experience I've ever heard of in in my lifetime I was like really more than the ones you've read about in the bible <laughs> more than the actual crucifixion <laughs> sue tolfa was another member of the prayer group that was familiar with the cross she says the cross used to be in an alcove area where everyone could come up and light the big candles and i've done that lots of times and anybody that has ever lit up a candle when you look up jesus is looking at you i remember the eyes were open very clearly the eyeballs the white the bluish gray <laughs> looking at the picture right now it's exactly the same it could not be any more the same <laughs> she says he was alive christ dying on the cross and his eyes were still opened and that on good friday they are we closed. crazy that night below the cross a parishioner claimed to have received a divine message he wrote it down and shared it with his fellow believers it how did he read... receive the message did he say it's well, divine, it's Allison. Divine. So I don't know what that means. Inside the head. Oh, <laughs> so he thought of something to say, <laughs> yep. and then he wrote it down. It read in part, <laughs> quote, I have given the sign for all those who have faithfully come. Truly, my presence is within this church. Within the months to come, many will flock to see what I have done. Welcome them, just as the people of Medjugorje welcome those who flock to see my mother. Mm. Stack explains that the two cities have, quote, more than a spiritual connection. Many of the parishioners of Holy Trinity Church are of Yugoslav descent. Four of the former Ambridge priests were born in the small town. Stack says some of the parishioners make regular pilgrimages to go to Medjugorje. Wow. It's not like they got the idea. It's not like they desperately needed yep. a miracle Tourism like and that a miracle. to happen in their... Yeah. So enter, thank God, <laughs> again, Suzanne Rini, Catholic scholar, voice of reason. She's yep. like, come on. She says the parishioners' um, impassioned faith led them into seeing something that did not exist. Love this woman already. <laughs> she says there's a very good possibility that, that it could be a, quote, subjective reality that's born of the desire for the people to share in the same type of miracle that Medjugorje experienced and a terrific hunger to have it happen there. She says it would also be like an affirmation that their prayer group is successful and pleasing to God and he sent them a sign. I was like, yes, queen. Group think. Yeah. Yep. Stack explains the Catholic Church itself shares the skepticism because the event can't be authenticated. So oh, it only it only blinks and cries for the people in the town, not for anybody else. <laughs> so and then this what this was when I was like, why doesn't anyone have a picture of it from before? Like because they hadn't shown any of this yet. But no one had like photographs to. Of course they didn't. Yeah. So what are you going to photograph? We're looking at the photograph. It's the same photograph. <laughs> <laughs> that they did have this photograph. Well, that's from video. Those oh. are video stills. So the church literally <laughs> investigates whether or not this can be called an official miracle. Stack says, in this case, by a commission headed by the local bishop of Pittsburgh. Father Ron Langwin explains that there is a value in people returning to their faith, but that you would want them returning for the right reason. He explains that if they found out later that it was a fraud, that could be very harmful to their faith. And this is why they're very careful in their investigations. Stack says that since that Good Friday, thousands have traveled to see the crucifix themselves oh how convenient for a town that doesn't have any money more. money 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 yeah. so and then stack is like there has been a miracle but he just 
basically says the miracle is that like this dying town was like reinvigorated. Yeah, and, that's like, not a miracle. A bunch of people were then coming through there. It's people using their smarts though. I respect that. Mm. But it's a little fucked up to do to people that are in your church or whatever. And like for yeah. all of them, how did that work? Did they all get together and say, we're going to do this? Did... Oh, no, no. I don't think it was like that It at was all. like just It is a... so difficult for me to believe that it wasn't like that. Like people, all of these people in this town truly believed that Jesus blinked and cried. They saw water yeah. coming from Jesus's face. They all believe that? We'll talk about this again at the end, but I think, yes. And I think that if there's something like in you, like when you hear someone else having this like divine experience that you're like, why am I not oh, having it too? And I, I'm listening then it becomes to this giant domino effect. The last podcast on the left right now, and they're covering Mormonism. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly oh, what yeah. Marcus Parks was talking about. How it's like, oh, if you don't see it's it. It's like, oh, is my faith right. not strong enough? So then you, you lie. Start to doubt yourself. Right. I'm going to go more into it. Okay. That makes so, sense. Mm -hmm. The Reverend basically says he still wonders if it is of God or if it's of evil. So the Reverend himself was like, not doubting that Jesus's eyes blinked. But who made him do it? But who made him do it? So he says, but what he does know is that people are coming there and praying. I know people are coming here. They have dreams. They come from all over the place. And when they leave, they have peace. So to me, this is all positive. Chris Marion, the state trooper again, then tells us that his five-year-old nephew said that Jesus closed oh, his God. eyes so that everyone else would open theirs. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> if he said that, he heard an adult say that. Yeah. He just reiterated it to his heart. Yeah. Yes. So Stack says that several weeks after the recording, the Bishop's Commission announced their decision on the investigation. He says the Bishop's Commission reviewed videotape and photographs. Okay, so somebody did have some somewhere. I don't know why they weren't showing them. But they show a split screen, the one we've been talking about this whole time, mm -hmm. between January 28th and March 24th of that year. It's gone. It's and a they miracle. look the same. Yeah, they look identical. They, they could look not look the more same. the same. They're from slightly different angles. Yeah, they're from different angles, but that's But it. they look the fucking same. So he says that um, they, quote, stated that there was no convincing evidence that a miracle properly defined occurred at Holy Trinity Church. This decision means that the Vatican will take no further action on this case. Stack says that the Bishop's Commission did still say that the witnesses were sincere. So goes back again to, I believe you believe what mm -hmm, you saw. Mm -hmm. Stack says many of the parishioners are still convinced that th what they saw really happened and still believe that a miracle really did occur. He says that at the very least, it did bring people together under one roof and one God. To many in Ambridge, the miracle cannot be dismissed. So, okay. research time. <laughs> um, so I do want to look into the other two miracles he mentioned really quick. Um, the one in Fatima, Portugal. This one was investigated but never gave a conclusive answer. So first of all, as I said before, it was children who saw it. Mm -hmm. um, second, there is like a ton of varying stories of what people actually saw that day. Third, science. Was that the one with the clouds? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The okay. sun touched, touching. Yeah. So I just said the sun did not touch the earth. <laughs> we would be gone. If, if something crazy did happen with the sun, more than just a few people would have seen it. Yeah. We all have the same sun. Yeah. <laughs> if it moved, for some people, it would have moved for everyone. Mm -hmm. If it would have hit the earth for Portugal, it would have hit the earth for all of us. Mm -hmm. It's pretty big. There's a number of theories um, about actual weather things that it do exist that may have happened that mm. these people did see. Huh. Um, so one of, among many, is called sun dogs. <laughs> Okay. Have you guys what? heard of that? No. It's like this weird thing that when the sun is in a specific place and the weather is doing a specific thing, it looks like three different like balls of light. Okay. Whoa. And I saw several pictures of it. So there are multiple things. There's another like effect where it looks rainbowy in the sky. So they may very well have seen one of those things yeah. just due to how the weather and was. And they didn't know what it was. And they were kids. Know what it was. And yeah. Yeah. It's God. So um, Medjugorje, there, I just wanted to update on this. One of the children from that day, uh -huh. her name is Mariana Soldo, Okay, still sees Mary once a month. Oh. And during her period. Every yeah, I was going to say, is it on her cycle? Are they on the same cycle? <laughs> does, does the Virgin Mary get her period? They're synced yeah. up. You guys. They're synced up. You can YouTube it and see every single time she's ever been up there because somebody videos her every single time. And what, Once the Virgin month, Mary comes to It's the second of her? every month. Oh, it's the second. Oh, so they have a standing appointment. She's now at a point where she like has to hobble up there. I don't think she's super old, but she has something like wrong with her legs where she, it's like hard for her to walk what? up there. Well, she has something wrong with her legs and she isn't super old. Can't she just ask the Virgin Mary to fix it? I mean, they've been hanging out you for would decades. Think they are They're BFF. Besties. Yes. They are BFF. What's her name? 
well, they call her visionary, Mariana Soldo. Oh. So look it up, YouTube it. She goes up there every time and does the exact same thing. There's thousands of people behind her. Oh, I wonder why she's so oh, praying. Wow. And she starts by praying, then suddenly looks up. And the whole time she's like taking notes about what the Virgin is telling her. It's Whoa, fucking no. crazy. I just can't believe this has been going on. And it's long. still happening. People yep. are still into it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mary keeps that calendar. Good for that visionary. Um, in stumbling upon a few other things, there are just so many miracles out there. There are. Um, the world is a miraculous place. S- yeah. Some more famous than others. Um, if you look up like a, a list of the top 10 famous pilgrimage sites, Fatima and um, Medjugorje are on the list. Ambridge, not so much. Um, there, are <laughs> sorry, oh, Ambridge. and there are miracles just happening all the damn time. There is even one called Shower Jesus that you guys should look up. The case first aired on September twenty seventh, nineteen eighty nine. Episode. The main thing I have to tell you about this is that Reverend Svitkovic resigned as bishop at the church in August of eighty nine. Oh, was this a scandal for him? I think so. Basically, the miracle happened in March of 89. An article I found from April of 89 had said that, quote, since Easter, when the Good Friday occurrence was reported in the media, more than 1,000 people from several states had been visiting the Holy Trinity Church each day, according to the church pastor. So I'm not sure when the filming of the episode happened, but I think that it would have been in April. Huh. So a few weeks later, the diocesan, would that be how you say it? Like the diocese, Mm -hmm. the diocesan panel investigated and then said, sorry, this is not a miracle. In June of 89, Reverend Svitkovic went on leave. Then in August, scandal. mm -hmm, Then in August of 89, before the UM episode had even aired, it was announced in the Holy Trinity Church Bulletin that Reverend Svitkovic had resigned. Whoa. So he just disappeared. Was he the one that he didn't, said that he didn't know if it was God or mm-hmm. a force of evil? Interesting. Yeah. He had cited his resignation as being, quote, in the interest of the church. He then went on to live in a monastery and was unreachable by the media. Ooh, he went dark and literally wow. went to live in privacy forever. So I think the story was made super, super public. It was all over the media. It was on UM. Um, They were probably pissed off that it was on UM. It was, well, maybe. Um, It was very publicly declared not a legit miracle. So it seems like that could have probably, like, first of all, shaken his faith Mm -hmm. to have that happen. But he was also probably really embarrassed that he was, like, on TV saying this miracle happened. And then the church was like, nope. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah, you might I want think to check with the the men in charge before you go mm-hmm. on UM. About and I'm sure like, like people from the public were like contacting him about it. Like I'm sure it was not easy for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Stack had talked um, at the end of the segment about how one true miracle had happened, and that was like bringing Ambridge back to life. But after the miracle was debunked, that didn't last. Yeah. Um, I found an article from 2004 about how four Catholic churches around the Ambridge area closed down due to the dwindling population of the area, including Holy Trinity. Oh, wow. Yeah. What year Um, was that? 2004 is when Holy Trinity closed down. Oh, wow. Reverend Svitkovic also passed away in 2004 at the age of 65. Artist Dominic Leo passed away in 2017 at the age of 90. Wow. Wow. That's it. Nobody talks about it anymore. Nobody talks about it anymore? Nope. Well, I mean, I think it's whether or not these people truly believed they were motivated by a bunch of extenuating circumstances. Totally. I wonder who has that Jesus now. I know. Oh. I tried to find it and I couldn't. Or like if it's still in the church, did they tear that church down? I would down? not be surprised if somebody from the church kept it. Yeah. Oh, shit. Or if um, the artist had it. Oh, yeah, maybe. Huh. Crazy. It's I mean, just crazy that like that many people can get on board after one teenage boy is like, Holy shit, look like what the, I saw. It's like, like It's like the Salem witch trials. Mm-hmm. Probably once they saw the boys crying, they were like, well, this has to be real because we don't allow boys to cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true miracle. It's 1989. We don't allow 16-year-old boys no. to cry. Yeah. So that's Blinking Jesus. You're welcome. All right. We have a fraudy. Fraudy, I wouldn't say, is the main um, yeah, issue. Yeah, I don't think that's here. the main issue Definitely in this segment. not. Not what I would have called this segment. Um, so. Also, you know how they do like a lead-in before the actual segment starts? Yes. It was just the three naked men in red bucket hats. What do you oh, mean? Oh, yes, I know. There were three <laughs> naked men in red oh. bucket hats? 
Yes. Honey. So like they'll do the lead in and then it's like commercial break and then it would come back with the fraud with the lines, you know, the UN yeah. design and the lead in. Yes. Is, yeah. I'll pull, I'll do a screenshot of that. Oh, that's yeah. awkward. So yes, this is our first nude, nudist camp. For sure. On UM. Yes. Maybe not the only, I don't know. Hashtag not all nudists. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Accurate. So uh, this is the story of William Eugene Hilliard. A true, full-on garbage person. Mm -hmm. So Stack begins by telling us that for over 40,000 Americans, the American Sunbathers Society says there are (laughs) 40,000. Being a nudist is a way of life. So I looked that up a little bit, and it's not called the American Sunbathers Society anymore. It's now called the American Association for Nude Recreation. Oh, <laughs> God. Just visualize that, that. Yes, that just gave me a visual. <laughs> and it's a naturist organization based in the United States. Well, let me tell you a little bit about it. The AANR is the largest, longest established organization of its kind in North America. It was founded in 1931 under its previous name, American Sunbathing Association. (laughs) Um, Approximately 200 nudist resorts, clubs, and businesses choose to affiliate with AANR, and the organization serves over 30,000 members in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, French, West Indies, Virgin Islands, and St. Martin. So the number's gone down since Stack told us 40,000 Americans. There are less nudists now. Probably a lot of those hippies have gone to the nudist colony in the sky. Uh So the organization promotes the benefits of wholesome nude family recreation and works to protect the rights of nudists Those in appropriate can't settings. Go together. No, I hate it. <laughs> Such as sanctioned nude beaches and public land set aside for that use, as well as homes, private backyards, plus AANR affiliated clubs, campgrounds, and resorts. My neighbor back there was a nudist. Remember? Really mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Were, were you, like he was always naked in his yard. Truly what? balls out Which naked. Balls out naked. The gentleman who passed away, he was like a, a belly dancer. Oh, my I love. Yeah, and he was okay. a nudist. If you were in my upstairs bathroom oh, and so you looked sad. out the window, he oh, would be Oh, my God, I remember him yeah. talking about the naked man. Okay. Yeah, I'm he was always nude oh all God. summer long. Yeah. I don't hate it. I mean, you you hear from – I think it's highly misunderstood. Sure. Um, and we'll hear, we hear from people in this segment, the owners of the camp that – our guy went to talk about how like people think it's you know sexual and all that and of course they have a different view of it but people will exploit it anyway like i believe that they believe that it's not that and yeah. it's right for some people but it's so, an e- a very easily exploitable totally exactly. Situation. exactly exactly especially when children are involved exactly so in february of 1988 garland rusty russell arrived at the sunny sands nudist resort in northeast florida and asked to become a member is that how it works? <laughs> he just, you just like literally. walk in with your dick out and you're like, hey, I'm here. No, he was clothed when he had that little meeting with them. He was clothed. He and drove then as up to the gates. Yes. Yeah. Said he wants to come in. He's like peeling clothing off as he's walking in. <laughs> you, have hey to guys, a, you have interested. to do a strip tease to a um, audition. <laughs> oh, Lord. No. So no. the nudist colony does have did have stringent requirements for joining, and they usually did not let single men join. They were considered in, ineligible. They should have stuck with that. But he was so charming and so nice, and he just seemed so caring that um, he was able to ingratiate himself within the colony, and the leaders awarded him membership. Mm-mm-mm. Nope. That was um, back when people didn't realize that monsters could be charming, attractive people. Yeah. Oh, yep. gosh. There are so many red flags in this that it's, yeah, mm-hmm. um, that people didn't know were red flags. Yeah. So he also, a normal fraudy thing, he told the owners of the camp, Dennis Noonan and his wife, Jerry Noonan, he told them that he had no family and that his parents were killed in a terrible car crash. And they asked, like, how do you make money? And he said he wasn't employed, but that um, his parents' estate was in probate and that once it got out of that, he'd be wealthy. Wow. He also claimed to have recently been discharged from the U.S. Air Force when the accident happened to, like, deal with family stuff. Oh, yes. He needs a lot of sympathy. Yeah. So he he had a sob story ready. He yeah. had a, like, I'm a loner. I need a community story. Wow. He and played them. Yes. 
So he went by Rusty, and Rusty soon became well-known and well-liked within the community. And, uh uh-uh, red flag alert. He was especially loved by the children of the community. Nope. Says Vicky, who we will come back to later. Vicky says that her children especially loved him and that they thought of him as an uncle or a brother. I hate it. Me too. So... Rusty claims to be a film buff. A film buff in the buff. (laughs) I should have named his store something like that. It would have been so good. I just realized that. (laughs) So he claimed to be a film buff, and he renovated an empty store in Crescent City, which was about 15 miles away from the nudist camp. He stocked it with videotapes that he said he had acquired while in the service, but there are, like, tons of them. I mean, it's a full store. Yeah, like, where did you acquire them? Yeah. So for members of Sunny Sands, which was the camp, he gave them a special deal. And so he'd go to certain families and say, hey, I have this way for you to make money and me to not have to pay taxes on this. So he would sell the tapes to them. This is it's confusing, but he'd sell the tapes to them. And he's in the actor who plays him in the reenactments. Really good. He's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, so you're going to write me a check for whatever, one hundred dollars. But I'm going to write you a check for one hundred sixty dollars. But you have to hold that check for 90 days and then you can cash that check. You make money and I don't have to pay the taxes on it. What? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. I know I wasn't following how it worked. Um, So he called it a tax dodge. And after that, he would then have them give the tapes back to him so that he could sell them as used tapes and not have to pay as much in taxes. I don't understand. That's a whole lot of VHS. Yeah. Really Stuff that I do not understand. (laughs) It's VHS science. What's above us? (laughs) So different investors within Sunny Sands noted that at first Rusty was keeping up with his promises. They got their money back along with 20% interest. Some residents invested up to $1,000 with him and received that money back plus the $200 interest. After four months, which we've heard, we've seen before, like they'll keep the game up for a while. They mm-hmm. won't just immediately leave. Yeah. They want people to trust them so that they can hit higher amounts later, Right, which he does. So after four months of all this he says he wanted to expand the store so he goes to a neighbor and the reenactment of this he knocks on the door and it's like a woman probably in her 60s or 70s totally naked <laughs> and she's like cooking at the stove <laughs> no. totally naked. i was like oh <laughs> she's cooking at the stove she doesn't even wear an apron no it's way dangerous. that's just straight up uh, not right? safe cooking at the stove she's like who is it he's like it's rusty she goes oh rusty <laughs> comes over and opens the door and he asks her for a twenty thousand dollar loan saying what? that he needed he needs it to like buy more equipment he says i don't know what he needs equipment for more tapes all for, this he's like i need for more rewinding all the yeah, tape people tape are not being kind and rewinding <laughs> So she just loves Rusty. She very quickly agrees uh, to give him the $20,000. Easy. And then six weeks later, he asked a second couple for $20,000. He did not tell this couple about his first investor. So. Obviously not. Obviously. Um, so they also agreed to it, thinking, gosh, we're going to make so much interest on this. Plus, we're helping him out. It's a win-win. Oh, my God. So, meanwhile, he's still doing great at Sunny Sands. Um, he's surrounded by happy families who helped support his business. And they have, you know, they eat together. It's kind of commune to, like, they just live life in community, Is basically. This when they started the montage of all the nude people doing menial chores because I couldn't handle it. Uh, yes. And this is also when he comes walking down the stairs with a plate of his food and he's like, hey, buddy, don't fill up on that because I got some of this right here. It's like a plate of sausages. <laughs> he just oh has his gosh. dick on a plate. <laughs> I just couldn't get over the like old men taking out the trash in their red bucket hat and oh, red fedora. Only. Yes, that, that was one of the people he asked for. That was the second couple yeah. he asked for a loan. I was like, you don't need clothes, but you need uh-huh. everyone to know you're a douchebag still. So. <laughs> Like what? I think that was before the entourage fedora. So. Oh my lord! He had to keep Definitely. the sun out of his eyes. Yeah, right. I mean, they need. It some wasn't protection. just accessories. He probably went through a ton of money in sunscreen. He should have opened a sunscreen store. So everyone loves, loves, loves him, and they continue to love him. Even though on August 28th, 1988, a an 11-year-old girl was seen running from his like little RV camper thing. And she says that he molested her, threw her against the wall, and then onto his bed, and then continued to touch her all over. She hit him three times and then fled in terror. Good girl. So yeah. 
she ran away. She told someone right away, which is very brave, especially because basically no one no believed, believed her. her. I know. Except for her mom. Can you imagine? So her mother is Vicky, who I talked about before, who said, my children loved him so much. <sighs> so she's alone in a house with him. So Rusty was arrested by the state police and charged with sexual battery. And initially, the judge was going to hold him without bail, saying he's not leaving until he's tried. But when questioned, he insisted that the assault was just horseplay, that they were wrestling and nothing sexual happened. He said, of course, what? I did touch her. We were wrestling. I'm wrestling with a naked prepubescent child. So the police did not believe him, thankfully. But the people in the nudist colony would not believe that he molested her. They would not believe the victim. Um, they turned against her family. Oh, my God. And believed she was lying. And they convinced the judge to release him on $25,000 bail. So the landlord at the video store that he ran in Crescent City, his name was Bob Pickens. Mm -hmm. And Bob Pickens went to visit him in jail. This guy's name's not really Rusty, but I'll call him Rusty for now. Rusty said, you've got to get me out of here, Bob. I didn't do it. He even says, I've been in this position before. I've been accused of this before. <gasps> Are you and he, they says really, right? he says that in the reenactment. Oh, my God. And you've just got to get me out of this position. <sighs> This happens to me or whatever. Everywhere um, I go, little girls say that I sexually <laughs> exactly. assaulted them. They're all against They're me. They're after me. Yeah. So he's able to convince Bob Pickens to pay his $25,000 bail. Jesus Christ. This guy was a smooth talker. So while so Bob Pickens is not in the nudist colony. He's just a landlord in Crescent City. So while Bob Pickens is arranging for the money to be available within 24 hours, the Noonins, who are the colony's owners, they're also trying to gather money for Rusty's bail. Oh but God. they start... This poor little girl. Uh, yes, It's like, exactly. that's why victims of sexual assault don't come forward. Yeah. Oh my gosh, exactly. Actually, All of your neighbors turn against you yeah. in yeah. like to favor this person that's fucking... No, not Rusty. Rusty would never, never. do that. Yeah. So as they're like looking through like his money to see if that he has any money he can put up for the bail, they're looking for, through theirs. They're trying to like gather money from the community. Um, they discover that he's overdrawn at the bank and he had been lying to them about what he owed or owned, sorry. Um, I think he had told them that he owned the video store building. Oh. Um, and so like in the reenactment, they're like, wait, he doesn't even own this building and he didn't. And he was like over a thousand dollars overdrawn at the bank. Um, so where'd he, all the money go? I mean, he took forty grand. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. So they just thought, okay, he's been. Now they'll believe him when they catch him in this lie. Oh, they'll believe her when they catch him in this lie. I mean, yeah. Sorry, they will suddenly be like, oh, maybe he's not, not a good guy. Not because he sexually assaulted. Money. Exactly. So they, now it's personal. They also discovered that he was having problems with creditors and many payments were past due. So the Noonans, realizing that he had lied to them, tried contacting the bonding agent to say, hey, wait a second, we changed our minds. We don't want him released on bail. But they probably missed him, missed the bonding agent within minutes and he was released with Bob's bail money before they could say, wait, we found this stuff on him. So he's out of jail. Then Rusty was also able to convince Bob to buy his video store, claiming that his reputation had been ruined and he would like never be able to run it again or sell it to anybody else. Bob agrees, oh writes God. him a big fat wow. check for it. Who are these Idiots. And then later, Bob learned that he was the third person who bought Rusty's inventory. So Rusty had already sold it all to two other people to, oh and got God. all that money from them. So after he learned the truth, he finally realizes he's made a ginormous mistake. He tried unsuccessfully to get the bail he had paid revoked and to get Rusty rearrested. But in the meantime, Rusty got some extra money by selling his car for $3,000 to a friend and then also selling his car to a dealership. So <laughs> he sold one car to two different people, got money from that. Then he rented another car and left the area. And he had a court date because he was out on bail and he never showed up for it. Of course it. he didn't. Of course not. So, of course, this is a fraud segment, but really he was, when the segment ended, he was also wanted um, for child rape and sexual battery and Stack tells us he could face the death sentence. Yeah, it's just so gross that UM could even be like, this is a fraud, fraud segment. segment. Yeah. Like, sorry. 
Yeah. yeah. It's really gross to call How could it, it not be a wanted segment? He was yes, on the run. it needs mm-hmm. to be wanted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so disrespectful. Also, investigators had used Air Force records. So he had been in the re- Air Force, but he was probably like dishonorably, dishonorably discharged, discharged. Probably. To determine that his real name was William Eugene Hilliard. So oh, his real name wasn't Rusty? Rusty? <laughs> and he had previously been arrested at, in at least 14 different states. Holy shit. And gained more than half a million dollars from his scams. And he was also wanted for fraud in Texas. They say nothing about him Damn. being wanted for child, child assault or rape. And I, you yeah. know there were other girls. Yeah, well, he absolutely. said there was when the guy went yeah. to visit him in jail. Yeah, this has happened to me before. Oh, my God. All right. So oh, fuck him. is this the first one of season two that we can add that was solved by UM Tips? Um, Did we have one from episode one? Yeah, the... the oh, yeah. Who is the guy? We're start, we don't have one. We need to start. Yeah, it. we got to start a new list. Um, so just minutes after this segment aired, uh, many, many viewers called in from South Carolina saying that they knew a man named Hilliard who looked like him. And one of the people who called was a current girlfriend of his who called oh, the tip line to identify a current him. Girlfriend. Imagine that. And sh- they had only been together like three months. Oh my God. Yep. Oh, can you... Oh, You're like, this is going imagine? so well. She was just probably like immediately vomiting. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he was... So he was living in Merle's Inlet and using the alias Ronald Edward Kent, one of 50 or more aliases he had used in recent years. Whoa. Yeah, so then he's arrested. Let's see. Oh, he was arrested 17 hours after the airing. Nice. Wow. Super wow. fast. His name, his name is also William Eugene Hilliard and Garland Russell, and he was booked into jail as Garland Russell. So he has two official names? Yes. It's, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, the girl who was his victim, they have. I read an article, and there's a quote. Um, she says, quote, I'm glad he got caught. It feels great to feel free. Oh, yeah. And then others in the camp were happy that he, of course, had been arrested and caught. This article says more than 20 people called the 800 number after the 12 minute segment. Wow, that's a lot. And over half of them said he was in South Carolina. So like a lot of people recognized him and knew who he was. Well, and that's the thing. Like he was this charming schmoozer. So like people are going to remember. Yeah, he's not like a hider. Yeah, that's not how he works. Yeah, that's true. Vicky, who was the victim's mother, said winning the lottery wouldn't feel as good as this. It protects other children. Oh. And um, they had moved away during this time. And then Dennis Noonan, who was the owner of the camp, said, I'm very happy the television show did what it was supposed to do. Well, hmm, you should have also done what you were supposed to do. Seriously. Then also, there is a man in Nashville, Tennessee, who is named Garland Houston Russell. And he's like, I want to know why Hilliard used my name as an alias. Does he know him? Oh. I don't know. So, okay, I've got something to show you. This guy's still alive. Is he in jail? Is still in jail. Good. Okay. And just take a look at what he looks like. Oh, and he no. is currently in jail as Garland Russell, okay. not as William Eugene Hilliard. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, that must not have been his real name anyway. So, but the guy in Nashville, Tennessee is like, why is he using my name? But he's in jail currently as Garland Russell. So I don't understand. Okay. Here's what he looks like before. Mm -hmm. Here's what he looks like now. Oh my God. He's got to be like in his 80s, 80s, late 80s. But look at him compared to, I mean, you can tell it's him. He looked like more of a goober than I expected Yeah. Yeah. in the first place. He, of course, pled guilty, was convicted and sent to jail without the possibility of parole. Wow. For sexual battery of a child under the age of 12 Good. and then the fraud stuff. But yeah, he's been in jail this whole time. Good. And will never get out and has never had the chance to get out. Damn. Damn. Yeah. If you have any nudist stories, though, send them for um, short stacks. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. I was also wondering if he had hit up nudist camps before. Right. As a predator. As a sexual predator. Was yeah. he um, in South Carolina? Did they say what he was doing for his occupation they or was didn't. he scamming people I there? don't think he was working there, but I don't know for sure. I also Probably wonder. Probably telling some story. I also wonder if his girlfriend had children. Oh, <sighs> God. Because that happens a lot too. Right. Oh, yeah. Shit. Yeah. So that's him. Total oh dick God. bitch. Later, Rusty. But we'll post his picture, his before and after. He looks like the creepy old guy from Family Guy that is always trying to <laughs> ugh, always trying to get Chris to come over. It's the yeah. popsicles guy? Yeah. 
<laughs> we'll post that like too. We'll post a side by side. <laughs> He's got like the creepiest oh, voice. Oh, ew, 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 ew. So well, I'm glad it. he was caught. Me too. Oh, good job, you bitch. Thanks, Eliza. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. To we're share ready. and feel. Yeah. Let's share and feel something. I things. share it. Okay. I feel it. i'll go first um because what i'm going to share is what every true crime podcast is sharing right now and recommending so i'm reading the killer across the table and uh it's by johnny douglas and then mark allshanker i'm reading the book but the audible book is narrated by jonathan groff the actor who portrays him in mindhunter cool i love that um but it's basically johnny douglas is the person that mindhunter is based on that he literally wrote the book on criminal profiling it's four cases like four lesser known cases that he had to utilize the more famous cases so it's smaller cases utilizing the information that he's learned so Um, cool yeah it's great it's a fantastic read and if you're into true crime and we've been watching mindhunter at night and then i go upstairs to read and i basically just pick up mindhunter and keep reading it (laughs) yes Yes. totally so it's been awesome i highly recommend it so definitely check it out yeah i also went on a mindhunter segue and started listening to atlanta monster Right. Because the Atlanta child murders are so heavily featured in that season. There is a lot of good reporting there. Yeah. And um, it's just cool because I just like watched the story and now I'm like listening to the story from some of the actual law enforcement that was involved in the case. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. I thought that podcast was great. Okay. Mine is The Righteous Gemstones on HBO. Oh, yeah. It's so good. It's created by Danny McBride. And if you want to hear more like from him and about the show. Um, he's on an episode of Armchair Expert, Dax Shepard's podcast, which is one of my favorites. But it's just about this very, very, very rich televangelist family, the gemstones. And of course, they're like terrible people, but they have to portray like they're these amazing people who love the Lord. Mm. It is so funny and so good. And John Goodman's great in it. It has Adam Devine, Tony Cavallaro. Cool. It's great. Great. And That's then, great. of course, I'm caught up on Succession, which is the best. It's so good. It's about just this really rich family, and mm. that one's very serious, and they all hate each other, and they've got this multi-billion dollar company that they're all trying to control, mm. and it's great. Should we say our segments for episode three? Yeah. Yes. So next episode, I am covering the unexplained death of Kay Hall. And I have got a wanted segment, but it it's is. actually a fraud. It's awesome. So it is one of my favorite segments I've ever covered. Yay! Oh. The coin scammer in New York City, honey. <laughs> yes. And then I have the unexplained death. It's an unexplained death segment about a woman named Mabel Wood. Very sad. Very <laughs> sad. And then I'm doing a missing person segment, uh, the missing fisherman on the Sarah Joe. And then wrap it up with one more, which is actually actually an FBI alert. Mm -hmm. The first one, right? Yes. Well, the first one, they're in a re-edit. Yes. We'll we'll talk about it next episode. But it's the case of Avery James Norris. Sweet. Yep. To see photos we reference in the episode, follow us on Instagram at re underscore solved mysteries on Facebook and Twitter at resolve the pod. You can contact us at resolved mysteries podcast.com. Or at our P.O. Box, P.O. Box, 14005, <laughs> Portland, Oregon, 97293. Send us your stories for listener short stack episodes. We're going to be compiling one of those in early October. So if you want to email us your favorite unsolved mystery story or cold case or any nostalgia you have surrounding the show, um, hit us up. And or we'll nudist, like- nudist stories. Oh, right. Or if you have any experience with a nudist colony, Some please. Some kids, like, they grow up in it their whole lives. and Do they end up nudists? Is it like being S- Amish? Um, I, would, yeah, I would imagine it's like being Amish. <laughs> I read Do you about, get like a rum springer where you get to wear clothes yeah. for a year? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I read about one family that the 15-year-old boy didn't like it and he always wore clothes, but the rest of his family are nudists, including like his younger siblings. And he's the weird one for wearing clothes oh in the God. colony. But the mom, sorry, real quick. I didn't like, like the mom was like, I... It's so free of like body shame. Like it's not. Yeah. You they get the kids do get to see like all, what all different bodies it look like. Normalizes normal bodies. Yeah. yeah. You're not covered in clothes looking through a magazine with yeah. Photoshop. Yeah. Like three layers of. Space. And I did like that about it. I don't know if I'll join one, but <laughs> get it, girl. Take those clothes off. Not sure yet. <laughs> Might apply. Um, but yeah, so if you grew up in a nudist colony, please let us know, and we'll include it in the short stack. We or have naturist. Oh, a naturist. Please. 
natures. Is that what they're called? Is that the PC? <laughs> that might be the PC version. Is nudist the prostitute of, <laughs> of nature? Yes. Um, we also have a merch store. So it's uh, resolvedmysteriespod.threadless.com. There's t-shirts, mugs, whatever the hell you want. There's so much stuff. Um, subscribe. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you like us, leave a five-star review and tell a friend. And like we said earlier, for every review we receive, we donate a dollar. And this month it is for Portland Chapter of Relay for Life. Um, it's a fundraising cancer walk event here in Portland. Do a review, not just a rating. Yes, you have to leave a written review and do not say dick bitch because they will pull it <laughs> and we will be sad. Um, and we will ask you to do it over again because we're shameless. Um, also, if you like the podcast and have a friend or two that you think would like it as well, please tell them about it because that's a really great way for uh, people to find out about us is just word of mouth. We love our little Resolve Mysteries community to continue to grow. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We, Bye. We sure do love you, honey. Yeah. We, sure do. <laughs> we do. Bye. 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 Take me off to the nudist colony in the sky. <laughs> let her let her know when I die. Okay. I'm gonna let it all hang out. <laughs> oh no, I just almost spit beer all over she my did. computer. Um. <laughs> Hey, everybody. We know you already like listening to Resolve Mysteries, but did you know that you can get paid while you listen to us and some of your other favorite pods? There is a free new app called PodCoin, and it pays you in PodCoins to listen to podcasts. Here's how it works. Find your favorite podcasts or check out new ones, listen to podcasts, and earn PodCoin while you listen. Then you exchange the PodCoin for gift cards at places like Amazon or Starbucks, or if you choose, you can donate the PodCoin to a nonprofit. So download the app on an iPhone or Android, use our special code MYSTERIES, and you'll get three 300 pod coin just for signing up. I use it to listen to the pods I already like, like The Shrink Next Door and Getting Curious, but I've also discovered a lot of other podcasts on there too. There are over 500,000 on there, so you'll definitely find something new. Download the Podcoin app on your mobile device, use our code MYSTERIES for 300 pod coin, and get a reward for something you're doing anyway, binging on podcasts.